Well, hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good to see y'all out there. Man, full house again. The first service was packed too in summertime. So that means everybody's coming back from vacations and hopefully you guys have uh, enjoyed some time this summer. Students ready to get back to school? That's sort of what I expected there. <laughs> sort of expected that. Oh, it's gonna be so good. Uh, man, was worship not amazing this morning? Can we just give it up for the worship team today? Man, so good. Hey, as Jen said, this is a, a Care Sunday, and we're also going through the Sermon on the Mount, and you're going to see how those two connect. But before we get into that, I want to highlight a couple things happening over the next couple weeks. First of all, next Sunday night is something we do called United. From 6.30 to 8.30, you are all welcome to come, uh, but especially if you are a leader or a volunteer. Um, we do this annually every year. It's kind of like out of summer, going into the fall, kind of regrouping time. It's about reminding ourselves this is the vision of Jesus for the church. And so he gets to lay out the vision. It's, it's the same vision that we've been partnering with. But we also get to say, what does that look like in this season? And we're growing. We want to continue to see God stretch us and reach more people, discipleship. But what does that look like? So this is a really important night. We're going to do some worship. We sit in round tables. You're going to hear me give the vision that we have but also like, how's that gonna look like in this next year, this next season? What are the opportunities ahead of us? What are some of the things we feel the Holy Spirit is, is just impressing on us? So it's a really exciting night to come and hear more about where we're going as a church, where we've been. Uh, also, we're gonna just have a time to hang out and fellowship. So everybody's welcome to come, 6.30, 8.30. I'd love it if you could take your phone, grab the QR code and register for it uh, because childcare is provided. And so we wanna make sure it gives us an idea of how to prepare for that. Um, um, so if you can go ahead and do that. And then at the end of this month, we have more baptisms. It feels like we're doing baptisms every week. It's almost like Jesus said to go do that, right? <laughs> Which is a great thing. We'll do them every Sunday if we need to. Um, we love baptisms here, but we have another one coming up. If you are interested, uh, you have questions, you're not sure, we want to just come alongside you. We either want to say, yeah, let's go for it, or just answer some of the questions you might have. Um, if that is you or someone that you know of, that's interested, you can grab, I think we have another QR code up here uh, in a second, and you can grab that for baptisms as well. Um, all the information is on the app for both United and for the baptism. If you haven't got the Grace Chapel app, um, you definitely want to do that today, uh, especially by the end of this service, because you're going to hear about some amazing things happening here. And you might be wondering, wow, how do I get all this information you can get the app. I would say the app is even better than the website only because uh, you have access to it pretty quickly um, and you can get to hold the stuff that you need to. All right, with that said, the reason I'm kind of moving quick is because I'm gonna preach for about 15 minutes. I know some of y'all are like, good luck with that. I know, I know what you're thinking. I know, I know, but hang in there with me uh, because we, we really have this exciting morning um, and we, we really want, you know, we're not just about Sunday morning gatherings, but what is God doing like every day all throughout the week? Um, and you're going to really see and hear some pretty phenomenal things happening that, that either you can be a part of or help carry that. Um, so we're going to jump into that. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. This is the series that we've been going through the summer, looking at the best sermon ever by Jesus. And as you're getting there in Matthew chapter 7, let me set it up this way. How many of you... Uh, and it's a rhetorical question. You can raise your hand if you want to. But how many of you text somebody? How many of you use texting? So how many of you are still sending smoke signals? How's that working for you? Yeah, some of you, yeah. But we, most of us text somebody. And when you text somebody, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. There, there needs to be a primer. There needs to be a course on the engagement, the rules of engagement when it comes to texting. Because how many of you, when you send a text, you expect an immediate response? Yeah. I, I, we know who you are. Okay. Who's, yes. Why aren't you getting back to me? <laughs> and isn't it true that like when you're in an urgent situation, uh, and urgent is so subjective, right? Somebody's like, it's urgent. And then like you, you turn, this is how you turn the dryer on. Okay. This is, how you, this is how you turn the washer on. But I needed to know. So all of us have this subjective lens, what's urgent. But when you send an urgent, let's say it is urgent, important, critical, and you send a response to somebody, you have an expectation of getting an immediate answer. You're hoping that the person on the other side shares the same level of concern, shares the same level of, of maybe anxiety that you have for whatever you're going through. So you want that. How many of you though, you're on the other end and you're like, I get texts all the time. You just can't respond as fast as others need you to. Anybody here get that? Yeah, 
That's true, right? It's, it's true for all of us. Uh, I, I typically try to have a rule of thumb if I send a text, again, unless it's like in the ER, critical condition, need to get a hold of me, those, there's, there's that category. But generally it's like I give people at least a day or two to, to get back to you because they have things going on and, and you know, they're trying to be present in a situation and so they're in a meeting. You, know, all, you understand the dynamics, right? But how many of you, when you send the text and you see the little bubbles and you get all excited? Because you're like, one, I know you see it. There's that part of it. But two, you're, you're waiting. You're like, oh, they're processing. Oh, look, and you're, and you're waiting. And then isn't it the worst when you're like, bubbles, 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 then nothing. And you're like, I know you saw it. And I know there's ways now that you can set up, you can set up your notifications. And I get it, I get it, I understand that. Some of us need to learn how to do that. But point of it is, when you send a text, you want a response. And when you don't get the response, you start getting kind of anxious, like, do they not care about me? Do they not care about the thing that I'm asking about? I mean, like all the things. It's, it's dramatic, this whole texting thing, right? The reason I bring this up is, isn't it true that we do the same thing with God? Isn't it true that when we, we seek out something with God, we pray to God, that it's the same thing. It's like, God, here's what's going on, and you're waiting. And wouldn't it be awesome if there was little God bubbles somewhere that told you he's processing and he got your message. And there's this part of us that we, we actually carry expectations into our relationship with God. Now, I will say this morning, we're gonna talk about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. And it does have to do with prayer. It has to do with relationship with him. But, but there's so many places in scripture, even Jesus said, if you wanna understand prayer, think of these things. And he actually says to, to seek these things out, daily bread, heaven on earth. So we, we have to walk away going, God, you really do want us to come before you, wanting us to bring our request before you. I mean, all throughout scripture, there's that invitation. But sometimes we, we get stuck because maybe our text will look something like this. Maybe I'll, I'll just show you what a text could look like. Someone's like, hey, God, you there? And then you don't hear anything. And so then you, you go down and, and you're like, hey, just checking in and haven't heard back, prayer hands. You still haven't heard back. Hey, God, sorry to, to bug you again, but things are a little crazy and I can use a little help. No response. Hey, <laughs> it's me again. Are you upset with me? <laughs> I'm starting to feel hopeless. Hello? I'm starting to feel ghosted. How many know what that means? The whole generation, like, what does that mean? So let me just ask this question. Ghosted means, if you haven't heard that phrase before, it means this idea that you've sent a message, no response back, and, and you feel like insulted, offended, whatever, they don't care. How many of us feel ghosted by God? You send your request, you send a message out, and you're like, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I haven't heard an answer, or I haven't heard, uh, or I haven't seen a response, nothing like that. And, and what do we do with that, that time? And it's in that space that I think for many of us, we have crises of faith. I look at it, and for me, I call it the silence gap. It's that gap of silence where you don't get to see or hear or the response, and you begin to fill that gap with sometimes bad theology. When we talk about theology, we talk about who is God, the nature of God, the goodness of God, and then we kind of go, you know what, um, hmm, maybe God's too busy for me. Maybe God doesn't hear my prayers. Maybe I've done some horrible evil sins and God's saying, you have to wait some sort of purgatory, some prayer purgatory before. Is it true that our spiritual lives and sin can impact prayer? Sure, because it's relationship. But all of a sudden we begin to assume some things that maybe isn't true of God or us in our relationship. And what do we do with that? In fact, I would say for some of us, the mystery of prayer becomes something more than just a mystery. In fact, I would say for many of us, mystery ends up leading us to a place of misery where we struggle and we begin to question and we begin to like, God, are you there? I, I would, might say it this way, if you're writing notes down, sometimes mystery can feel like misery, unmet expectations on our end, plus unknown explanations. Like maybe it would, you'd be okay if God didn't answer your prayer with the direct way you want him to answer it, but even if he sent a message that said, working on it, hang in there. Things are happening. You don't know about it. You're like, okay, I got, it. I got some sort of explanation. But I think that's actually why God sometimes doesn't want us to bring prayer into a place of formula where I do X, Y, and Z, and then if you do a response the same way, then it equals the same results because then we would treat God that way. We would treat God as just a, a means to an end. 
versus someone to be known by and to know. And so isn't this true? We, to level the playing field, we all struggle with this. So this is where we pick up in this text. Watch what Jesus says. If you're going there with me, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says it this way. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Look at the person next to you and say, ask. What does he say? Ask and what? Ask and you'll be put on hold? Ask and you're going to get rejected? What does he say? I mean, let's just be honest. If I'm reading the Bible for the first time and I have no other passage of Scripture and Jesus is like, hey, let me tell you, if you ask, it's going to be given to you. You'd be like, sounds like a great deal. Or then he goes on to say, seek and you will find. Sign me up. Goes on a third time. Not only does he say ask, he says seek. And then thirdly, he says knock. And then he says it will be open to you. Now, those are three really amazing answers to what you and I would say if I ask, if I seek, and I knock. God seems to be in a position through the words of Jesus ready to respond. Would you agree with that? And then you read on and you go, okay. And then he says this, and the one who knocks and the door will be open. You're like, I, how many doors am I waiting for in my life to be open right now? But, I, but they all seem locked. So I don't know what to do. I have decisions I need to make, relationships I'm in. I have circumstances of life that I need God's power. I need wisdom to navigate. And all these invitations seem to be like, ask, seek, and knock, and God's going to show up and respond to you. Which then we take that to the bank. And I think for many of us, we take it to the bank like, Jesus, these are promises, right? I've been asking, I've been seeking, I've been knocking, but it doesn't seem like I'm finding. It doesn't seem like you're opening. It doesn't seem like you're, you're giving. And I think the problem is many of us read this passage like it's a blank check. And we go, go, oh, Jesus just gave us a blank check. I can ask for anything. I can seek for anything. I can knock for anything. And he's just got to write that blank check. And that's where we, again, align wrong expectations. So what does this mean? I have just a few moments. I don't have time to go into a lot on this, but let me just help capture what I believe Jesus is saying. The word here for ask is not just any simple word. It's not just like, hey, I'm pulling through and I'm like, hey, which, uh, where's the restrooms at? And someone's like, oh, they're right down there. That's a casual question, critical situation. I understand at times. But we ask and you kind of go, oh, okay. The word here for ask, it's, it's the language and picture of a beggar. It's on the side of the road that has nothing, destitute. And this beggar is, is holding their hands out saying, help, I need you. So it's this aspect of desperation. In fact, I, I would tell you that when you look at each of these words, ask, seek, and knock, Jesus is, is building layers to our prayer life and more than prayer, but relationship. Because I think for many of us, we see prayer as transactional, when prayer should be transformational. And so if you're here and you only understand prayer as transactional, this won't make sense to you. But if you see prayer as transformational and relational, then all of a sudden you see this progression. So Jesus starts with the first thing he says to ask, and asking it's about posture. So when you go to ask God, it's a posture. It's a posture of God, I'm desperate for you. God, I'm, I'm looking to you. You are the only one that can be the solution to what I'm seeking for, asking for, and knocking for. So when he says to ask, it's like I come as a beggar and it's with the right posture. It's a posture of desperation. Because isn't it true, let's just be honest, that instead of Jesus being our first response, he becomes our last resort. And we go, okay, God, I've tried and I've exhausted everything. Now I'll come and ask. And he's like, you started in the wrong place. You should have started with me in, in the first place. And so asking, it's about posture. But here's the interesting thing. When you have asking prayers, asking prayers, if, you, if you're reading up here, it's about releasing prayers. Because God wants to release the resources of heaven to your desperation. You know, sometimes I would even argue that God's like waiting for us to get desperate enough so that we finally come before him. He's like, I've been holding this. You know, the Bible tells us that we have every spiritual blessing already at our access. All promises are yes and amen in Jesus. So it's not that God is a God of scarcity, that God doesn't have the resources. He does have the resources, but sometimes we don't have the desperation that matches the unlocking of the resource he wants in our life. And so it's, first it's a posture. Number two, he says to seek. Now the word for seek here has to do with priority. Because isn't it true that, again, like I said, we can seek answers in all these other places and then Jesus becomes the last resort. And the word here for seek, it's not about the posture, it's about priority. 
Jesus is speaking to this idea of those who seek me will find me. Those who seek me, you're, there's a reward on the other side of that. How many of you have ever done an Easter egg hunt? And when you look at, like, like let's just be honest, when a kid, you just know this, and if, you, if you're not a kid, remember when you were, because it was cool, okay? Give yourself permission. You, you got lined up there on the field, you were waiting for it, and when the permission was given, you went flying into the field looking for all the eggs, right? You were seeking those things out. Let me tell you, every kid, I've never seen this before, but every kid I've ever watched line up for an Easter egg hunt. When they're given the go and they go running in the field, grabbing every one of those Easter eggs, they're not thinking about everything else. Like that's what you're obsessed with is what's in front of you. You're, you're seeking that. And so often in our lives, we aren't seeking Jesus. We're seeking other things that we just want him to bless. I, I, there's an author by the name of Pete Gregg. Pete Gregg wrote a book. Uh, I recommend it to you. And it's a book called God on Mute. It's a great resource. He's written several on, on prayer and intercession. Um, but this is one that, um, that we do recommend, at least I do. And what's interesting is Pete Gregg says it this way. Let me just read a quote to you. He says this, God's great aim has always been and will forever be relationship with us. Sometimes he may deprive us of something in order to draw us to someone. And when we reciprocate, when we decide that we want him more than we want his stuff, the most amazing thing happens. We are rewired and our requests are either altered as we grow to know him and to prefer what he wants for us, or they are simply answered because in seeking first the kingdom of God, all these things are given to us as well. See, when Jesus said to ask, he talked about posture. When he said to seek, he talked about priority. In our seeking, is he who we really want or do we just want his stuff? Because if you don't notice yet, but something's happening through that process of asking and seeking, and we get to the third one, which he says to knock. And knocking is about preparation. Asking's about posture. Seeking is about the priority that he's the one I'm pursuing. I want him, not just his stuff. And then when I finally get to a place of knocking, it's about him preparing me for what he has for me. You know, in other places where the story is, is told, Jesus elaborates more. When he says, it, it's like a person, and he gives a story, who's a neighbor. And this neighbor has some relatives or friends that drop in. Everybody has the, the drop-ins? And you're excited when they drop in. They're out of town guests. So Jesus goes on to elaborate on this story. He says, imagine this. Imagine that you're someone, and some people pop in. They were traveling, friends, family, relatives. In first century hospitality, if anybody popped in, even if it was unannounced, like it was your job to give them food, to take care of them, to nurture them. And so Jesus says, okay, imagine that it's in the middle of the night and some friends pop in and you're like, oh, I gotta go feed them. So you go to the cupboard and there's no food, there's no bread. So Jesus goes on to explain that then this individual goes to the neighbor's house, starts knocking on the door, starts knocking on the door, starts knocking on the door, trying to get a hold of them because maybe your neighbor's gonna have some bread that you can borrow. And then as the story goes, the neighbor's like in the middle of the night, sleeping, going, who's interrupting me? Like your urgency is not mine, but what's going on here? You need some bread. And what Jesus is saying, it's about this idea of persistence. But I think this is where we get persistence in prayer wrong. I grew up sometimes hearing different people talk about prayer and persistence as it's about nagging God and wearing God down. Or it's about negotiating with God. It's about God. I've been, come on now, I've been saying this prayer repetitively over and 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 again. Was that not annoying? Think about that with God. And we have this wrong view of God that he's someone to be pestered to the point of a breaking point. Then he's like, okay, finally, here you go. That's the wrong idea here. The idea of knocking, it's not about pestering God, it's about preparation of my heart to receive what he has for me. I, I would say it this way. God prepares us for what he's prepared for us. Sometimes God wants to bless us, but we're not ready for it. Sometimes God wants to answer the prayer, but, but we're not prepared for that. And so what we could end up doing is either squandering the blessing or mishandling it or, mis, or misunderstanding it or whatever. So again, what Jesus is walking through from ask, seek, and knock, he says asking is making sure you have the right posture. Seeking is making sure you have the right priorities, that he's the one we want. He's who we're seeking. And then thirdly, he says, it's idea about seeking and knocking is this idea of that he's preparing me for the things that he wants to do. Because right after this, he changes gears a little bit. Watch what he says next in verse 9. 
He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Now, this is what he does. He's talking about fathers here, and you can apply this to moms and dads both. But let me just ask you a question. How many of you are dads in here? Just raise your hand. Good. How many of your moms are in here? Okay, good. How many of your kids? Watch what he says. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? And then he goes on to say, and what if your child comes and asks for a fish, you're going to give him a snake. Now, you, you and I sit here and we go, I would never do that. My kid came to me and they needed something like food, necessity of life. And G Jesus is trying to make a point here. And this is in the context, like this might be actually more important what Jesus is saying here than the ask, seek, and knock. Because what Jesus is trying to help us understand, keep reading with me, he says this. He says, and though, even though you are evil, because you're human beings, you're imperfect fathers or parents, he says, even though you who are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who seek him? Don't miss this. This is the most important part of what Jesus is saying. If you have a wrong view of God, it will drastically, I would say it will turn your prayer life into ruin. It, will, it would allow you to approach God with the wrong understanding of who he is. Jesus is saying, listen, listen, you all a bunch of parents, you know what it's like. Your kid comes and asks you for some bread. You don't give them a stone. If they come and ask you for a fish, the word here is for viper, like a deadly viper snake. You're not gonna give them something hazardous or harmful. And you're like evil, horrible parents, kind of what he's saying. He's like, you're, you're like imperfect parents and you know better that when your kid asks you, you don't give them something. Jesus is drawing a parallel and then he says, how much more your perfect, good, loving, gracious, heavenly father. He just wants to bless you. He wants to give good things to you. What he's saying here, don't miss this. This is like critical. You can trust your heavenly father. I think why prayer life is a struggle for most of us, we've never really wrestled with the lie, do I trust God? Do I trust him? Is he someone that I can see as a good father? Because maybe for some of us, we grew up in a home and our, our earthly father was abusive or abandoning, and so we project that onto our heavenly father, and so then it makes us reluctant and resilient, not resilient in our prayer life. We, we try it for a little bit, and then we're like, you know what, I give up because I just think he doesn't care about me. I think he's just abandoned me because I'm used to that. Do you see how that dynamic plays out? And so what Jesus is saying, listen, the core to asking, seeking, knocking is really that you have the right understanding of a good, good father. And he loves to answer. He loves to bless you. He wants to reveal things in you. But he also wants you to be in the right posture, the right priorities, and the right preparation to receive what he has for you. So here's the interesting thing. And this is the last part I'll say. He changes gears, but it's connected. You read the next verse and you go, that doesn't belong there. It seems like it. Because as he's talking about this idea that we have this good father in heaven, we can ask from him, we can seek from him, we can knock. And he's all talking about this idea of this vertical. Now he changes in the same context about horizontal. Because now what he says in verse 12, he says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus says, listen, listen, don't miss this. There is a horizontal part of how God wants to answer prayers in our lives. Some of us, if we were to look at how maybe I would call it the geography of prayer, I might show you a chart that looks something like this. There's little you, me, and here we are with these burdens that we carry that we're seeking out of, that we're knocking and we're asking. And this is us. And God's like, yes, bring those things. Come before the throne room with boldness and receive what you need in your time of need. And like, okay, we quote all those verses. So like, that's the part where we go vertical. Okay, God, I'm bringing all these heavy requests to you. And oftentimes God will say, great, directly, here's the answer. Right now in this moment of, of intercession and connecting, I'm going to answer. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to do it right here and you see it. But oftentimes, and I would say maybe even more often, the heavenly response comes through another person. And what Jesus is trying to let us understand here is that God is orchestrating behind the scenes that he is working in somebody else's life to be his hands and feet, to be the provision, to be the answer so that that works back to you. So this is why this is important. When we pray, we don't just pray with our mouths, we pray with our ears. Because as I pray, I say, God, these are the requests. I'm also at the same time going, I wanna hear from the Holy Spirit. Am I the answer 
to somebody else's prayer. Because this is how God works in community. So it's on that note that I want to transition. You're going to hear from a lot of people this morning that we believe God is using as an answer to prayers in your life and the lives of others. So I want to invite Brad, Justin, and Lynn to come up here. Would you guys welcome them to the stage this morning? What you are going to be uh, really blessed by here in a second is what does care ministry look like, not as a program, but as a response to prayer and what God wants to do in the context of community for those who are asking, seeking, and knocking. I'm really excited for what you guys are going to see. Thanks, Mike. Well, my name is Brad Peterson, and I get to be the uh, Director of Counseling and Care, which is a... Uh, well, well, you'll hear more about our care ministry here, um, but specifically I oversee the counseling aspect that comes under our care ministry and get to work with um, both Justin and Lynn, who you'll also hear from in a moment. But one of the things is I invite our care team or those representing our care team to come up. I want you guys to uh, know two. that this is a verse that um, really gives me a lot of inspiration for the role that I get to have here at Grace Chapel. So is there a maker in the way up? Um, let me read this. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. So many of us are pastors, teachers here at Grace Chapel, and we are blessed to have a role, um, and we get paid by the church and, and have a, a set-apart role. But here's the second verse. Their responsibility, so my responsibility as a pastor or staff member here, is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Or some of you have heard the term equipping the saints, which is another translation for this passage. And so what you're seeing here forming behind me is uh, a group of people, saints, God's people, all y'all in the body who have been equipped to do a certain ministry. And we're going to hear from each one of them. And as, as Mike shared, you know, from that passage, Jesus says, you know, in light of ask, seeking, and knocking and your good heavenly father, he says, now go and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so you're going to hear just a, a snippet from each person um, as to what they've received from the Lord and they're asking, seeking, and knocking, and then how they have now kind of paid it forward or are returning um, what they've received. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Hey, guys, I'm Justin. Uh, I am so excited and grateful. Um, I know I've said this to you guys before, but thank you, thank you, thank you. We honor you guys for what you do, everything you put into this, and how you love people. So, um, yeah, it's, it's my honor to oversee Soul Care and um, get to work with all these amazing people. And um, there's 17, yeah, 17 ministries represented here um, out of 19. And um, those that aren't here are Betrayal and Beyond and Mending the Soul. So um, if you have any questions about those, you can come see me. But uh, all of these folks will be out in the lo lobby afterward. So if you have any questions, anything else you want to talk to them about, either uh, if you want to support or if you want to be involved in some capacity, um, just go in and chat with them there. Uh, I just love how they have, um, how they're pursuing Jesus. And they, like you will hear, have received something in their life. And they want to be the conduit of that hope, that support, that freedom, that healing, right, for other people going through the same things or similar things. So uh, we get a chance to hear from all of them now. And um, one thing that Brad and I were saying is, like, uh, how many of you guys like Costco samples? Anyone out there? So uh, we get, <laughs> this is kind of going to be a smattering of co uh, Costco samples this morning. And then um, we'll let, we'll let a, a few more uh, share at the end a little bit longer. It's like if you get the good sample and you, like, you want it and you start eating it on the way to the checkout stand, you know, uh, at the end. So, um, Brad, why don't you start down there, um, and then I'll, I'll go after you. All right. And as a reminder, each of you is going to tell everyone your names and what group or ministry you lead or represent. And then they're going to answer the question, what kind of support or healing or freedom have you received? Uh, and how do you see God working through you to help and provide other, uh, those to others now? So we'll start here with Mr. I won't say your name because you will say it. Mr. Keith Swanson and my wife, Lindy. We're both um, co-leading um, Freedom in Christ Ministries and specifically Beta Course. Um, it's, a, it's your next step in discipleship in Christ. And um, that's what we do. Um, how it's impacted our lives, or my life anyway, is um, help me to trans it's transform my life. It made me a disciple of Christ. 
It let me deal with, with things that were footholds and strongholds that hindered me, like uh, I had a panic attacks for 15 years and um, things of this nature that were broken through, and then I was free to serve God and free to know God in a way that I wasn't ever before. And Lindy's experience is similar. So we get to share that blessing with each of you as you come to the class and we go through that journey together. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Carl? So I'm Carl. I'm part of the Care Connections team. And uh, what it is is kind of lay people who um, have had some, some small training from Brad um, in counseling, not professionally trained counselors. But um, So I've known Brad for a long time. I think we went over that last time I was up here. Um, and he has supported me and my wife through counseling. And so it was easy for me to, when he asked to, to step into this and, um, just kind of, you know, knowing his heart and, and him identifying a gift in me of intentional listening. And I'm just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Hello, my name is Austin Radford. I am a individual couples and marriage counselor for Heart of the City. Um, this all started back when I noticed when I was healthiest, when I was able to process with someone, I was able to work with the church, give back to those in my community, and honestly be healthiest for my wife as well, who really appreciated that. So my hope is to help as many people also reach that health, to be able to give back to their church, their marriages, and the community as a whole. Thank you. That's awesome. All right, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Williams. I'm at the heart of the city. Um, I started doing this when I was younger. I just thought I needed to serve God and thought to do missions. When I did, um, I thought being raised in the church to go far because generally you reach out very far. And I did, and all I got from that was that um, I can serve anywhere. And so when I started at the heart of the city there, um, I get to find that as Mike had talked about previously about the, what is it, the park, the coffee shop and living room, yes, um, the heart of the city is the park for here, and it's very local, and it really hits to be able to serve people right where they're at. We serve anyone and everyone. We don't just serve the church. We serve the entire community. We use what you guys give, and we help people in their um, biggest need. Um, we've helped financially, we've helped spiritually, we've helped emotionally, we connect them with counseling, we connect them with services. Um, we even start reaching out with other community services to help them out. And so. Hi, my name is Fred. How are you doing? <laughs> so I am on the Ada Set Free group, and it's a sexual addiction group. I came to it because of the fact that I was a hypocrite. I profess that I love God with all my heart, soul, and strength, but I encouraged behaviors and acted in ways that were not healthy. So by going to this group, I met a community of men that embraced me and said, we love you. We're not going to condemn you. Jesus loves you, and we want you to get healing. And because of that, because of the camaraderie, the accountability, and the exhortation, yes, I hate that word. <laughs> I'm getting better. And the men in the group are getting better because we're all serving one another. And to that end, we are serving each other and we are teaching men to go out, whether they stay in the group or not, to help other men because this is a needed ministry. It, we jokingly say, welcome to the group that nobody wants to belong to. <laughs> but it is a necessary one because there is no shame and condemnation in Christ Jesus. Come on. Hi, my name is Gracie. I'm a part of the Divorce Care for Kids program, and so is Preston here behind Justin. Um, I Four years ago, my dad left, and my parents went through a very long and complicated divorce. Um, and when all of that first happened, I had never been more isolated and disconnected in my life, and two of my biggest prayers in that time were just being desperate for community and really wanting that. Um, and something I asked God a lot in that time was, I really want to use this brokenness and this pain to help others, whether that's one person or a multitude of people. Um, so coming here a year and a half after that, um, and just the friends and the mentors in my life that I have now who 
don't just support me in the mountaintops of life, um, but just needing people where in the seasons of my life where I'm not seeing Jesus, I get to see Jesus through my loved ones here and in the communities I'm a part of um, has been such a blessing. So, and doing divorce care for kids now has really been an answered prayer to provide kids with a safe space who are experiencing something that is so painful and confusing at that age um, and just taking my experience and getting to pour into kids and then at the same time be equally as poured into getting to minister to them. So, um, Hi, my name is Molly Hike. I support the In the Waiting Infertility Support Group. Um, it was through our personal journey to parenthood that we learned that one in six experience infertility and one in four experience miscarriage and loss. Um, through our personal journey, it created opportunity to create a family building foundation. Um, we ultimately became parents through uh, embryo donation and gestational surrogacy, um, but presented the opportunity for us to lean in and really be able to help others. And so this group is a confidential group, um, really to provide support, resources in a safe place, no matter how your path is to parenthood. Sometimes it it creates an opportunity that you never would have expected um, and a really great opportunity to connect with, with others. All right, keep on moving. We'll come back to you guys later. Uh, hi there. I'm, 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 I'm Leo uh, with Hope Chaplain Ministries, which actually is a branch that kind of grew out of the, the ministry r r response team from Grace. So I'm a first responder chaplain with about nine different agencies. So uh, I go into the homes of the broken and uh, uh, I provide hope. Um, what got me there is uh, my daughter at 20 months old had cancer and nearly died. So I had this, some darkness, the hair, and then a few years after that, um, had a spouse get cancer as well and, and go home to be with the Lord. But uh, kind of through those journeys of the darkness, I always have the light and the love of Jesus with me. So now I'm blessed uh, as a chaplain. I get to go into the homes, go in the darkness with others and bring the light and love of Jesus. Good afternoon. I'm Stacy Kane I'm with the prayer team ministry and also Care Connections too, but I'll be talking about the prayer team ministry. My testimony is one of God's heart of faithfulness and goodness. Over the past several years, Holy Spirit has moved in my life pretty significantly and grown me in uh, some supernatural ways through prayer and this community. Our family hasn't been excluded from facing deep pain and loss like so many others in this room have might have gone through recently. But through it all, his presence, faithfulness, and goodness has been very evident. He is a good father. Since joining the prayer team in January, it has been such a blessing and a privilege to join with others as we seek the Father's heartbeat for each service and um, his words of life and encouragement over each individual that will be present that day. It's been such an incredible joy and honor to see his faithfulness in this. Andrew? Hi, I'm Andrew Arthur. I'm with Genesis Christian Mediation. For me, I think answering those questions kind of revolves around the theme that God doesn't waste pain. Um, so how many of you have ever experienced conflict in relationship? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. Don't be bashful. Well, congratulations. You are all qualified to be mediators. For some of you, that's all right. All right. Some of you are very terrified right now about what I'm going to say. Um, so... My pain moment began in 2017 in the midst of a difficult divorce journey. And I learned that God was bigger than what I could even imagine. Um, in the midst of that moment, while attending Grace here, um, God kind of called me into this mediation moment um, to learn about what he has in store for conflict for each of us. See, conflict can be very kind of a cringy word. It elicits a bunch of different responses. But the truth about it is that God wants to bring beauty and connection in the midst of conflict, not just disconnection. And so mediation is just that. It's about searching for what God can do to heal and repair and bring and, and restore in the midst of a hard thing of conflict. I'm going to go down on one knee. Look at that. 
Okay. Well, I'm Diana, and I co-lead the Grief Share Group with a lady named Linda. Um, I lost my husband in a motor vehicle accident, and five months later, my mom. And Linda lost her husband due to complications from surgery. Uh, we both went through the Grief Share Group at different times, different places, and then uh, here we are co-leading this group at Grace Chapel. And it's so extremely important that people understand you don't go through that alone. You need people to help you go through it. Um, because of our experience, we, we are equipped to help. And it's a really safe place where you can come and just be yourself and express those, that pain that you're going through, but also to learn some tools that God has given us in how to go through that journey. So God is faithful. He loves us dearly. And those moments, we don't understand what's going on, and they're dark and they're hard, but God never, ever leaves us because he promised. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And he's there every single moment loving us dearly, and he will help us get through it. Uh, Carmen Ryan, uh, counselor at Heart of the City, specializing in kids from 4 to 14. And I have a business background, but God had different ideas. So more than a decade ago, um, my oldest son's dear friend passed of a drug overdose two weeks after graduating from Westland Wilsonville High School. So my husband Steve and I took him and a group of his friends to the funeral and it was a Mormon church, even though they weren't Mormon. And I looked around, and the church was just filled with grieving children. And there was a handful of adults, and one of them was Mr. Swearingen, who was an incredible Westland Wilsonville um, counselor. And at that moment, I knew I was called to uh, be a counselor, school counselor, not in my plans. Um, with Steve's support, I went back to school and got another master's degree, and I have been serving as an educator and school counselor for the last 12 years. Um, I'm going on my ninth year at Lowry Primary, and then about six months ago, I felt called to uh, pursue my professional uh, counseling license, and I reached out to Brad. And at that time, he and Elizabeth were beginning to search for a counselor to work with children. Uh, we all decided it was a great fit. And uh, so we're ready to go. Um, it's just such an honor working with families and helping children to be who God intended them to be. Help them be calm, grounded, and I use, you know, play, nature, art therapy, mindfulness, yoga calm, collaborative problem solving, crisis care, and, uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Diane Schnickels. I am the founder and director of Living Waters of Hope. We are a minister, educational ministry to restore hope and dignity to uh, victims and survivors of domestic abuse. Gals, if you are in the restrooms, uh, you, that's our um, flyers in the restroom stalls with the Oasis Bible Study that we've written specifically for Christian women. One in four Christian women are impacted. Um, my journey began 15 years ago when my daughter unexpectedly ended up in a very abusive relationship. Um, she, I'll just say she's lucky to be alive today. And I learned an awful lot through, from a mama's heart, the pain of seeing her and feeling so helpless. And then I've had other controlling relationships, not my marriage, but others, sadly, within even the faith community, people that you trust, you thought were friends. And so the pain of being on the receiving end of the controlling behavior and also on the trying to be that support. Um, so I've taken all that that God has showed me through his healing and through his word and just his faithfulness in my life, and we've created this study so we can give those that same hope to women. Um, if you just are uh, want to learn, you know, have questions about, you're not sure about your own relationship, I'd love to talk with you. If you're separated, we are here for you. If you're divorced, we've had women say, I just know I need more healing. Please do not suffer alone. We are here for you. We offer a safe and confidential online community. Thank you. 
so uh, we have Pure Desire, um, Conquer, and Seven Pillars. Um, the leader who's been leading us for about three years now is un- unable to make it today, but he's passing off the reins to this gentleman, Mike. And so now we get to uh, hear from you. All right. Uh, my name is Mike Stennett. Um, and basically to set things up, uh, about 10 years ago, Barnum and a number of other surveyors went out and did a bunch of surveys in our churches. And those surveys among men showed that um, the majority of our men at that time is about 65 to 75% of men had issues with sexual integrity. Um, And I can guarantee you today, it's even worse with the proliferation of pornography online. So it is a huge issue. These are men that love their wives, they love their families, they love their savior, but they're trapped. And if you're one of those men, you're in the majority, you're in the minority if you are not having these issues. So it's a huge issue. It's something that you cannot take on in isolation. You have to get together with a bunch of other guys that are taking it on. Um, so yeah, me and Fred, we know each other very well. Um, these are both very good groups that that take this on. And I just, I beg of you guys, um, for your families, for your wives, um, have the courage to step out and take this on. So. Oddly enough, I didn't get anyone who came up to me after service last time. So uh, so anyway, but I got you guys covered. I went ahead and put my name and phone number in the bathroom. Um, I assured Carl that I didn't carve it into the stall there. So, so he's good. He's doing okay. But um, I should have asked the praise and worship to play Rushing Waters after, after worship here at the end of service. But I didn't think of that. So anyway... Um, let your husbands go use the bathroom afterwards, no accidents on the way home. But that's the other thing. Or there's online, you can also contact us. So thanks, Mike. That's it as right. far as our samples. Those are the samples, yeah. Let's um, dive in a little bit here. Uh, you guys will notice we're um, a few of these shirts here. The ministry response team on the back says uh, trained, equipped, willing. I might have mixed those up. Trained, equipped, willing. Yep. And. Uh, <laughs> A few others are wearing the shirts around here too. Um, ministry response team. So, so Eileen and George are representing the ministry response team. We have an uh, incredible team. And um, George, why don't you start, and then you can pass it to your wife. When I walk through these doors, well, first of all, my name is George, and I'm with the MRT ministry response team. And we go out on the fields when we are called, and we assist other individuals that are going through crisis. Uh, they may range from loneliness to a death in the family, maybe, or, or something to that degree. But when I walked through those doors about two and a little over two years ago, I never thought I'd be up here sharing with you guys here. And my first time here vis- visiting, I saw this body of believers, and this is a body of Christ here. And it is, it is important to love the body of Christ as it is to love the head of the, of the body, which is Christ. So, um, you know, there was been times in my life where, you know, I've been lonely or depressed, but I never stay there. Uh, there's times when I had to convince myself, number one, that God loves me, number two, my wife loves me, and number three, that my children love me. And those were hard times, and I had to convince myself, of those three things, that love from God, love from my wife, and love from my children got me through these these seasons of time. Uh, But, you know, one thing that I do know is that wisdom from above always includes love. And the MRT, it's all about compassion and having mercy. And they sort of go hand in hand. You know, if you have compassion, well, you have mercy. You know, if you have mercy, you certainly have compassion. And this is one, one gift that I know that the Holy Spirit has given me. Uh, so let me rewind here. So when God calls us to service, it's always bigger than ourselves. It is a requirement to love others. Love is sacrificial. What I have learned in my walk with Christ is that my life is not meant for me. It's meant for you. It's meant for others. Because I cannot, um, so time is the most important thing I can give someone. 
because I cannot take that time back. I can give somebody a $40 bill and be able to recuperate that or recover that. I could, you know, purchase a, a bag of groceries for, a, for a, a, a stranger and I could recoup that bag of groceries. But my time is, is, is valuable to me and therefore it's more important to me that I share my time with you and the other people in the community or anyone else that I come across with uh, out in the, in the community outside of church. Um, we have this empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We are in partnership and relationship with the Spirit of God. So when we go out on a call, we are not alone. Ministry response team gives me opportunity to be present with others in time of need. There are seasons in my life when I have to convince myself again that my wife loves me, God loves me, and my children love me. To me, this is mental and emotional hygiene. God doesn't promise a smooth flight. He promises a safe landing with open arms. His work and his... God is amazing and prepares us, sorry. God is amazing and prepares us for his work and his glory. And I just want to encourage every one of you to, to step into to some ministry, whatever God's pulling on you or, or tugging on you. I know every, every one of you have a gift. And I just want to encourage you that you, you use that gift. If it's once a month, so be it. But God honors that. Uh, and serving, you know, comes, it comes with a cost, but the, but the rewards are enormous. So, you know, hopefully, prayerfully, you guys can go out there or in your own time figure out what, where you want to serve. And I know there's a lot of people here, Pastor Mike and the staff, you know, they, they have your back on wherever you want to serve. Thank you. Good job. Hi, my name is Eileen, and I'm uh, part of the ministry response team. And as I was uh, praying about what to share, um, I heard the word loneliness. And I'm sure everyone here has one time or another in their life, you know, felt that feeling. Um, so this does resonate with me because before, when, before I was a believer, I was really very lonely um, very, off, very often. And mind you, at that time... I was 40 years old, I was married, I had three kids, a career, yet something was missing, and I knew it. Now, as a believer, I realized what was missing was God, and once I heard and I received and accepted his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness for my sins, I've never felt that loneliness ever again. So, moving forward, to like, you know, 25 years later, to the, res the uh, ministry response team. What I like is when a need comes or they get a call, um, Justin will send out a text group, uh, a text out to the group. Um, and I like that because it allows the Holy Spirit to just work, um, to do his work and allow... Um, whoever he deciding he wants the person to respond to that call. And it, plus, I realize um, God's the best organizer for any meeting. Um, I may not totally um, relate to all the troubles or even all the, or even have all the answers, but I know being present and willing to give my time to be with them means a lot to another person. Um, and I know that because they told me. Um, but I also realized, um, well, I find it no coincidence on all the calls that I have gone on, um, these people were like alone. They didn't have anybody. Um, family wasn't really around or they weren't connected to their family. Um, and I know what that feels like. And they just wanted to have somebody talk to them, pray for them, um, give some spiritual guidance. Um, listen to them so they could be heard or even just to be seen for just a moment. Um, I've also realized it was a blessing for me because it is, 
words are hard to describe, but it is wonderful yet humbling to be used by God to help another person. Um, and also I realized that when I'm there, I, I don't have to worry about having all the answers because God is with me. He equips me. He enables me. And um, even the classes they give us are actually wonderful. Um, they equip you very well. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Judy Campbell, and I'm representing the Redeemed and Restored Ministry here at church. I want to tell you a little bit about my path to finding this group. <clears throat> Excuse me. My husband, two years ago this past Wednesday, was called home to be with Jesus and to live the rest of his eternal life in heaven. And while I was thrilled for him because he was no longer suffering, after 57 years together, it left a huge gaping hole in my life and my heart. And the only thing I knew to do at that point, because I didn't understand the path ahead of me, was to pray. And my God is faithful to answer. So I asked for direction and guidance from the Holy Spirit, and I believe I got that. Within the first week, I knew the two things I was to be obedient to were to be stay involved in the small group we'd been part of for years, and to be here at church with all of you for that sense of community and that I wasn't alone. I was also encouraged to take advantage of the counseling ministry here at church and through Heart of the City. And I took the Grief Share class where I met other women and people going through the same thing. I was eventually invited to come and share my testimony with the Redeemed and Restored Ministry and. I learned a lot about what God was doing in my life as I prepared for that, looking back, seeing all the ways he was caring for me. <clears throat> we sing a song here, even when I can't feel it, he's working. Even when I can't see it, he's working. And that's the one thing I would say about re redeemed and restored. It's when you come there and you listen to the stories of what God is doing in the lives of people around you, you learn God is working, and it's encouraging. It gives us the confidence to walk in our faith with strength and courage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan Zetter, and this is my wife, Sarah. And we are the leaders of divorce care here at Grace. And when I first walked into a divorce care class, I was definitely broken and at my end. It was a time in my life where... Um, I had three young children, and I just didn't know what God's plan was. But walking into that support group immediately gave me a sense of community and um, just a home and a safe space that I was able to um, be a part of. And so in, in that process, I just gained so much understanding and tools and healing. And it's been incredible to see how God's used that. And now we are leading a class, which starts up on September 13th. 13th, 13th. yeah. Um, at seven o'clock. And so, and my story is, you know, when I got out of my divorce, I felt a lot of shame, anger, um, unforgiveness, which a lot of people do feel that same type of emotions, a lot more emotions than that as well. But going through this class, there was this sense of community where we could come by each other and not feel alone. And our Savior is such a redeeming God. I never thought that um, he would use that pain to talk to others, but like Mike talked about. I mean, that was right on, on the money, um, just us using our pain and the experiences uh, to share with others and to comfort others. Uh, it's been a blessing. That's uh, 6.30, by the way, not 7. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Trisha? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Trisha. Um, I'm representing ARMS, which is Abuse Recovery Ministries and Services. Um, we provide services for those who have experienced um, domestic abuse uh, through recovery programs for women, intervention programs both for men and women. Um, a statistic was shared just a little while ago about the one in four Christian women experience uh, abuse. I was one of the four. Um, in that process I, of coming out of a lot of denial um, of what I was experiencing, um, my women's pastor, bless her heart, said, you wanted to know what to do next. I got a problem. I got a sol solution for you. Um, and brought me to my very first Her Journey program. 
Um, it was through that experience that I gained uh, a real understanding of what I had experienced, um, the freedom to be able to move forward, um, and hope for myself, my family, for my kids. Um, God worked on my heart uh, through that program for three years. It's a 15-week program that circles around again and again. Um, and after the first year and a half, my women's pastor said, so you want to leave now? And I went, mm, no, not ready. <clears throat> but God kept calling on my heart, and eventually I, I found myself leading a Her Journey program. Um, but that wasn't the only calling that God gave me. Um, God stirred my heart. I had uh, four kids, four amazing kids who are grown up now. Uh, and he said, there is more <clears throat> in the recovery process. And that's breaking the chain, breaking the cycle of abuse. And we do that by recognizing that we are making some poor choices. We don't know what we don't know until we know it. And, um, and so I got called into ministry to uh, serve in part of the intervention program. So not only do I serve with the women who are experiencing um, abuse and, and having recovery and hope and healing, but I also work with the men. Um, in their intervention program and being able to recognize, uh, take accountability, and have true heart change. So we, we have those three programs. We have our Her Journey. It's a 15-week program, like I mentioned, uh, which you can take again and again and again and again for as long as you need. Uh, it's free. We uh, service locally as well as internationally. Um, <clears throat> we have Zoom classes. We have in-person classes. Uh, and nationally, not just internationally and local, but also nationally. Um, we've got programs in Kenya, in Mexico, in Canada. Um, I've had the pleasure and the honor of serving women um, in Australia and Hong Kong and the UK through our Zoom classes. Um, and then we have our men's intervention program called Mankind. Um, that program's a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> again, it's, it's focusing on recognition change. Um, as well as our women's program. Um, sometimes women also begin to recognize abuse. It's a learned behavior. So we either learn to give it or accept it until we break the chain. So our virtue program is for our women. And then we have our last uh, newer program, which is training. So we provide training for leaders um, and those who are interested in becoming leaders for the Her Journey program, the Mankind, and for the virtue. Yeah. Thank you so much, Trisha. And on behalf of all, I mean, I just want you guys to see and hear um, from each of these people, and there's so much more. I mean, each one has more of, to their story. Each ministry has more layers and dimensions to it. But if you could just give it up for these folks for being so willing, that would be awesome. You guys can make your way off stage. Thank you. As, as Mike comes back up, I just want to say real quickly, you know, we had several people come up to us after last service and say, hey, this is an area that God's been faithful to me in, um, and it wasn't mentioned up here, or do you guys have anything in this area? We just want to openly invite anyone that has something they feel like they could be up here at some point or involved uh, in our soul care ministry, please let us know. You can just email us, soulcare at Grace Chapel Online, or you can just come up to us after the service. Lynn? Oh, my bad. <laughs> Real quick. Gonna... Sorry, guys. Grand finale. <laughs> no, yeah, there we go. No, please stay up here. I, I, I wanted these guys to all be up here because I just wanted you guys to be in awe of yeah. your prayers can be answered through the people up here and maybe for your family. Um, uh, who knew that God can take our pain and make it into our superpower? Like, seriously, mm -hmm. like... Where else can we find this in the world? And I just want to share my testimony with you really quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, I came from a horrific childhood. I was uh, a victim of people, collateral damage of people's poor choices. And that kind of continued through my life um, until I found out about Jesus. And there was still bad stuff that happened. I didn't know what to do with it until I submitted and I said I no longer wanted to be held a slave to, to the pain because Satan doesn't want us to do these things. Satan doesn't want any of these people up here. They, he wants them slaves to their pain. And 
what was offered here is complete freedom for all of you and complete freedom for me, complete freedom for Mike, Justin, and Brad. We've all experienced one way or the other. And we're just all here to tell you that the way is through Jesus. And I'm so thankful that I know him and I'm so thankful that he is in our lives and I can pass that to my children. I love her story. Here's what I'd love for you guys to do. We just stand together. We're going to dismiss right now, but this is how dismissing is going to look like today. Um, we start off with ask, seek, knock. And you just saw an amazing group of people who said yes to Jesus to be a conduit of his love and his grace and an answer to a lot of prayers that are probably sitting out here right now. And I'm going to ask the, the care team, all of you guys that shared today, they're going to make their way to the lobby. There's some balloons out there. That's way you can identify who they are because as we are praying into today, we know there's some of you that are sitting there going, that's who I need to talk to. I need to talk to them because what they're talking about, what their ministry is, represents the ache in your heart that you've been asking and seeking and knocking and maybe it's not for you, but maybe it's for a loved one or a friend. And how many of you, let me just say, how many of you are blown away today that you, you had no idea of the scope of care ministry at Grace Chapel? And you're like, I had no idea. I had no idea all these things were happening. And that was the vision of Brad and Justin and Lynn was to say, we're a church that cares. And if we're gonna be a praying church, we have to listen to how he wants us to answer the prayers of others. And so maybe today as we dismiss you, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let the band just play. It's just gonna be kind of instrumental music. It should kind of almost be like what we would call just a time of soaking. A little bit different than how we normally end our services. And so if you're here and you're like, I need to go talk to that person in the lobby because I just, that, that's the conversation I need to have. Then we're gonna dismiss you after I pray. But we're gonna allow the room to just be filled with the atmosphere of just resting letting the band just play. But up here on the stage is something we don't want you to miss out on. We have buckets right here. We have three buckets, and in each of these buckets is a, is a blank card with pens. And we're gonna ask you, I'm gonna pray, and then as we dismiss, if you wanna come up here and write out something that you've been asking, seeking, and knocking for. You don't even have to put your name on it. But when you're done filling it out, this basket's gonna be full. Because right now, there's a lot of cards in here from first service. So if you're here and you're like, I'm gonna write on that card something I've been asking, seeking, and knocking. When you put it in the basket, here's our commitment. We're gonna take every one of these cards that represents you. And we're gonna take these and we're gonna disperse them amongst our prayer team, the staff, the elders. And we're gonna make sure we join you in your asking, seeking, and knocking. And we're gonna live with expectation to see how God might answer some prayers that come from today. So this basket's gonna sit right here. I'm gonna pray for us. And as we dismiss, if you wanna go and say hi to some of the, the care team out there, if you wanna come up here, grab a pen and paper and leave your prayer request, you can do that. And then just, you're on your own to dismiss yourself. So I just wanna pray over us. God, thank you for everyone that was here this morning. Jesus, I don't believe in coincidences or happenstance. Lord, I believe that every person that was here today, you spoke to very specifically. You wanted them to know that you're a good father, that sometimes even when we don't see our expectations met, that doesn't mean you're not working, moving, that you're not transforming us, you're not shaping us, that you're a good father, and we can trust you with the things that are on our hearts. Jesus, I thank you for every person that represents an obedient call to say yes to you, that you're turning their pain into the care and comfort for others. And Jesus, you're all about that. Jesus, I believe you're even called some people today that Today's the reason they showed up to say, here's how I can use mine. I can serve and help others. And so Jesus, for every prayer request, for every ask, for every seek, and for every knock, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you bring encouragement and comfort. Pray your grace and your blessing on all this. We praise you for what you've done today. We live with expectation of what you're gonna do to be the answer to all of these things. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I mean, you're dismissed. You can come up here, fill out your prayer cards. You can go out to the lobby and connect with the care team. And God bless you guys.